Hi, I'm Phil Hall, and this is my 31st video discussing 1950s British science fiction. For this video, I want to switch away from Mushroom Publishers and talk instead about the uh, sudden growth in hardcover British science fiction books. Uh, most publishers up until the 1950s, most publishers before the 1950s, carefully avoided labelling their books as science fiction. But all that was to change in the 1950s. Let's investigate. A search of the bookshelves of the most avid collectors of science fiction will reveal a surprisingly large amount of hardcover science fiction and fantasy published by the respectable mainstream publishers in the UK, both before and between the Second World Wars and the following decade. Apart from the wonderful early novels of H.G. Wells that were more or less kept constantly in print, such eminent authors as Olaf Stapleton and Aldous Huxley and S. Fowler Wright who wrote science fiction, along with lesser luminaries such as George Goodchild, Gerald Hurd, and many others. Even Edgar Wallace wrote a science fiction novella, Planetoid 127, presented as a mystery. You'll see a mystery there in the crime book series. Even if the scientist on the back cover was a dead ringer for William Hartnell's Doctor Who. But the important point is that they were not usually identified as science fiction. Instead, the blurbs referred to the books as imaginative fiction, scientific romance, fantasy, a parable. Aldous Huxley's publisher, we see here, referred to these books as uh, a, cautionary a cautionary tale, a satire, and a prophetic nightmare, a warning to mankind of what will happen if we persist in our present follies. In other words, science fiction. There are a lot of hidden gems by lesser known authors such as The Curry Experiment by A. A. Rayner, published by Locker in 1947, a quite remarkable early anticipation of human cloning that is not even listed in any of the science fiction references in encyclopedias because it was only blurbed as an imaginative story. Collectors are hereby alerted to try and seek out this rare and rewarding book. Science fiction novels, therefore, had always appeared sporadically in Britain, but they were rarely, if ever, actually labelled as science fiction on their covers or inside blurbs. In fact, the first time the word science fiction appeared on the dust jacket of a hardcover book, was with this, this title, The Intelligence Gigantic by John Russell Fern in 1943, boldly labelled as a master thriller science fiction novel. The same enterprising publisher, who had of course earlier published the magazine Tales of Wonder, had in fact put out Eric Frank Russell's Sinister Barrier a few weeks earlier, which we see here. Uh, and that didn't have anything on the cover, but did mention science fiction briefly on the blurb there. Back to the world's work series. Here we see Liners of Time, Fern's uh, next novel, published in 1947. But these and the science fiction label 
was again prominent, but it had disappeared by the time the Golden Amazon Returns came out in 1948, although the uh, inside blurb did refer to the uh, novel as a science fantasy. There we see Fern's uh, inscription to his mother. Now the final foray in uh, 1940 science fiction by World's work was uh, The Call of Peter Gaskell by George C. Wallace in 1948. But again, it didn't have any cover label. But the uh, title page, as we'll see in a moment, The title page did have the uh, Master Thriller science fiction novel. Now then here, here we see the next significant development. As the 1950s progressed, the science fiction label on the jackets of British hardcovers became the norm, rather than the exception. It's these generic uh, science fiction series that I propose to look at in my videos. Now then, this book was one of the earliest harbingers of the coming boom in hardcover science fiction. Tomorrow Sometimes Comes by F.J. Rea was published in June 1951 by Hohen van Thal. Although not identified as science fiction, the deliberately evasive uh, blurb here, reading, it's not fantasy. It's based on an extension of scientific knowledge already in existence in recent research. Or in other words, it was science fiction. There's a generic cover by New World's artist Bob Clothier. Uh, makes pretty obvious. In fact, the book it, it originally appeared as a series of short stories in New World's magazine. But the eccentric publisher didn't follow it up after this promising start. It was left to the venerable firm of Grayson and Grayson, who were first off the mark with a bold and sustained, clearly labelled line of science fiction hardcovers. Initially, these were all American reprints and it appeared to have been carefully chosen. This was a determined assault on the science fiction market. No less than three American titles were released simultaneously in July 1951. The Voyage of the Space Beagle by A. E. Van Voort and two anthologies, Men Against the Stars and The Best Science Fiction, edited by uh, Martin Greenberg and Blayla and Dicty. All three had darkly attractive pictorial jackets Signed just CWB. Now then, the jackets announced the publisher's manifesto. From America, a land of science and the machine, comes a new kind of book, foreshadowed in the works of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Science fiction answers the age old query what next? Science fiction is written by men with the scientific know-how, men who, however far their imagination may range, convinced by the attention to detail and to the fundamental truths of science's magic world. Science fiction is exciting, convincing. So, there we have it. Gone were all the taught you as apologetic euphemisms. Here was the real thing, and not afraid to speak its name. It was a breath of fresh air and deserved to succeed. It did too, sustained across the next five or six years and in inspiring countless imitations by other publishers, as we'll see later. Van Voort's Space Beagle a novelisation of his vintage novelettes from Astounding Science Fiction magazine was quintessential science fiction. 
The producers of the much later famous movie Alien were sued for having plagiarised one of the stories and very wisely quickly settled out of court. That's how good this book was. And Grayson's first UK edition is now a real collector's item. The, uh, the fourth uh, book, which we see, see there, uh, was by a new artist, E.B. Mudge Marriott. And he did most of the dust jacket cover art in bright, attractive pictorial designs with iconic science fiction imagery. Although the actual technical details and the hardware were a little vague and naive at times, indicating that the artist was not too familiar with science fiction or astronomy. I mean, look at that ring planet there, that's, that's not Saturn. But he made a decent stab at it. His work would attract the attention of several other publishers who were also security services when they followed Grayson's lead. Other experienced science fiction savvy cover artists used by Grayson included Harold Johns and E.J. Pagram. The success of the opening salvo was not immediately apparent as the rest of 1951 passed without any follow-up titles. However, the following year, the best science fiction was reprinted in March and was followed by Possible Worlds of Science Fiction. By uh, Groff, Groff, Groff Conklin. You see here, lost my place for a minute now. I, Robot by Isaac Asimov, followed in July. Best Science Fiction Story Second Series, followed that. Asimov's book has come to be recognised as a classic and has also been filmed. So Grayson's attractive first UK edition is now extremely valuable. The year finished strongly with perhaps the finest of all early American science fiction anthologies. Adventures in Time and Space, edited by Helian McComas. Unfortunately, with only 11 out of an original 33 stories, the UK edition was severely truncated, but the selection was still an excellent one. Unaccountably, the publisher missed a golden opportunity by not buying any of the remaining 22 stories to make up another selection. Here we see the much thicker American original. This was the original 1946 American edition of this groundbreaking anthology. And there we see the contents, all the 33 stories. Grayson's book just reprinted 11 out of those stories. Many of the Grayson anthologies were in fact abridged from the American originals because of the British paper shortages, which has led to these editions being overlooked by collectors today. But they were pioneering and important editions in their day in 1950s. The 1951 programme of Grayson's consisted entirely of American anthologies, beginning with the Galaxy Reader of Science Fiction, edited by H.L. Gould with the wonderful Harold John's Dust Jacket. The ubiquitous team of Blyler and Dicty had two titles, the year's best science fiction novels in April and the best science fiction stories uh, <coughs> Let me see here. Yeah. 
Judith Merrill offered a more eclectic choice of stories than Beyond Human Ken in July. It was somewhat ironic that when a British hardcover publisher had finally had the gumption to launch a successful line of science fiction books, he should ignore British authors and look to America for their titles. What an opportunity was missed. 1954 looked like continuing Grayson's obsession with American magazines, beginning with Conklin's Strange Travels in Science Fiction in January, and in February came The Unexpected, an original British single author collection, John Christopher's The 22nd Century. Unfortunately, this was not followed up. All four remaining titles were again American anthologies, Greenberg's The Robot and the Man in May, Conklin's Strange Adventures in Science Fiction in June, and two from John W. Campbell Jr., the first astounding science fiction anthology in March and the second anthology in November. It was back to America for all four 1955 titles, with two more anthologies from Blayla and Dickey, the year's best science fiction stories fourth series in January, the year's best science fiction novel second series in December. Conklin edited science fiction adventures in Dimension in, in March. Costigan's Needle by Jerry Sowell in November was only the second novel to be used. As I will discuss later in these videos, a strange blight settled over British science fiction in 1956. The end was in sight for Grayson's series, only two titles appearing in 1956, both of them American anthologies. The Best Science Fiction Stories 5th Series, edited by Blyla and Dickey, and August Durless, The Other Side of the Moon, in April. One further last title, Murray Leinster's rather pedestrian Operation Outer Space, was held over and eventually sneaked out in January 1957. Grayson's long run of initial success had both positive and negative consequences for British hardcover science fiction publishing. The positive aspect was that it set other publishers scrambling to follow suit. The negative was that there was an overwhelming concentration on American authors and on anthologies. But all this was just the tip of the iceberg. More hardcovers and publishers to come in my next videos.